Okay, so we're going to move on soon. We're going to look at a lot of properties um, that these hyperbolic functions enjoy. And we'll find that actually in a lot of ways, hyperbolic functions are almost easier to work with um, than trig functions. And they, they, have a lot, they, they have a lot of similar properties in the sense of the way derivatives and integrals work, uh, identities that they satisfy, right? For example, we, we see this one here, right? I mean, there's a difference of a sign, but pretty similar. But um, just to kind of familiarize ourselves and get an idea of how things look, one of the things that's kind of nice to do is say, well, what, what do these look like? What do the graphs look like, right? And we can start with a hyperbolic sine function, okay? Uh, the other thing I guess I should mention, pronunciation. Um, did we talk about this? Yes, we did. Sanch, Kosh, Tanch. Some people like to say this. I don't really like to. Um, sounds weird to me. Uh, and of course, there are three more that I didn't write down, but they're less commonly used. So, you know, if we, if we need them, they're defined in the obvious ways, right? Um, Cotangent, hyperbolic cotangent is, is 1 over hyperbolic tan, so it's cosh over sanch, right? Um, hyperbolic secant is 1 over hyperbolic cos. Hyperbolic cosecant, 1 over hyperbolic sine. Um, we, we can discuss those as well. Um, now, what does, what does hyperbolic sine look like? Well, one of the things we can do is realize that for, for large positive values of x, this is going to be a tiny number, and this is going to be a really big number, right? So for large positive values of x, we expect that the graph looks something like e to the x over 2, right? For large negative values of x, this will be a tiny number. This will be quite, quite big, right? And then the minus sign on, out front is going to flip it, right? So, so e to the minus x goes like this. Um, but because we're taking the negative of it, we, we flip it. So what we get is something that looks uh, like this. Right? So here's, here's e to the minus x over 2. Okay. So we expect that the graph should line up with those here and here. We're just going to get an idea for what goes on in the middle. Um, now... It's pretty easy to see that hyperbolic sine at 0 is 0, right? 1 minus 1, I get 0. So we know it has to pass through the origin. Um, the other thing we might want to know is, well, what's, what's the slope as it passes through the origin? Well, we know how to get that, right? Take the, take the derivative. Um, and so here's, here's an interesting thing. What do you get when you take the derivative? of the hyperbolic sine function. Well, you have e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2, right? Now, that 1 half is a constant multiple. We can bring it out front. Derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The derivative of e to the minus x is e to the minus x, with a minus sign, minus e to the minus x, minus minus, becomes plus. And interestingly enough, what you get is hyperbolic cos, right? So the derivative of sine is cosine, whether you're talking about trig functions or hyperbolic functions. Um, this is true in either case. And if you go back and you, you know, way back to chapter two, when you look at the, the work that we had to do to prove that the derivative of sine is cosine, um, this, is a, this is a heck of a lot easier. Um, so, okay, so hyperbolic functions have at least that going for them. Okay, so we know that we should have a slope of 1 as we, as we pass through the origin. And, and so you essentially just try to piece all that together, right? And you get something which goes like this. Okay, so this gives you... the hyperbolic sine function. Okay. For hyperbolic cosine, it's a fairly similar story. Although, one thing you might notice about this is that it's, it's never negative. In fact, it's never zero. Uh, the minimum value for this, 
Um, well, the minimum value is going to happen when the derivative is zero. Okay. Um, what's, the, what's the derivative? What's the derivative for hyperbolic cosine? Might as well find that out while we're at it, right? Okay, so one half derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Derivative of e to the minus x is minus e to the minus x. And oh, check it out. You get hyperbolic sine. Um, without that annoying minus sign that comes you know, with the trig function, right? We know that for cosine, derivative of cosine is negative sine, right? Hyperbolic function, derivative of hyperbolic sine is cosine. Derivative of hyperbolic cosine is hyperbolic sine, right? No minus signs. Kind of nice. All right. So, and, and we also know that hyperbolic sine is equal to zero at zero. So hyperbolic cos sort of has a minimum value of one at zero, right? If x is zero, we get one plus one over two, which is one. And it looks a bit like, and once again, it's going to look a bit like, you know, um, uh, e to the x over two. If x is large and positive, it's going to look a bit like e to the minus x over 2 if x is large and negative. And so what you get is something that looks like this. Okay? So that's the hyperbolic cosine function. Probably should be a little bit steeper on the sides. Um, this uh, this curve, by the way, that you get from the hyperbolic cosine is called a catenary, um, and and the catenary is an interesting curve. It solves a number of classical problems. Um, a catenary is the shape that you get if you take a, a chain or or a rope and you hold it from the two ends and you just let it dangle, um, you know, under the influence of gravity. You, you get exactly this shape. You get a hyperbolic cosine. Um, the catenary is also interesting because it solves two kind of classical problems. The um, one is called the brachistochrone problem, which is the if you had an object and you just let it fall under the influence of gravity, um, what is the curve that sort of would cause it to fall fastest? Turns out it's this one. Um, the other one is what is the curve so that you know if you let something go and let it slide down, under the influence of gravity, the time it takes to get to the bottom is the same no matter where you release it from. It's this curve. Same one, turns out. Um, and, and actually, um, there have been people in the past who, because of that property of this curve, tried to make, you know, like uh, um, pendulum clocks where the pendulum tried to follow um, a catenary curve rather than, you know, a typical sort of circular arc like it normally does. Um, the, the last one, uh, hyperbolic tangent, that I'll try to draw, you can see pretty quickly that it has two horizontal asymptotes. Okay? If x is large and positive, y equals 1 will be an asymptote. If x is large and negative, y equals minus 1 will be an asymptote. Right? Um, we can see that here, right? For large positive values, these are negligible. You get one, right? For large negative values, that's negligible. You get minus one, okay? And so you get something which goes like that for the hyperbolic tan function, okay? So that gives you some idea of the graphs. Uh, in the next video, we'll look at some additional properties that these functions satisfy.